Welcome to the Marriage Counselor's Corner. Right this way. Your therapist will see you shortly. In the meantime, sit back, kick your feet up on the couch, and get ready to focus on adding very valuable tools to your marriage toolkit. And now your host and marriage counselor, David Taylor. What's up, everybody? This is David Taylor, and I am your host. You have come to the right place. (laughs) This is the Marriage Counselor's Corner Podcast, and I am so excited to have you guys with me today for this second episode. Welcome to the couch, guys. You're in for a nice show. And by the way, if you don't know, the Marriage Counselor's Corner Podcast is a place where you get credible and tangible marriage-related information from a licensed mental health counselor. And over the last 18 years of my clinical experience, I have discovered things that work to make your marriage healthy. So see these episodes as a masterclass in marriage, where I take a psychological and very practical approach to marriage education and enrichment. So this is episode number two. And in today's session, I am going to be discussing a topic that is very, very important to your marriage. In fact, it's so important that if you don't know this information, (laughs) not knowing it will be extremely detrimental to your marriage. I'm going to be talking about the 10 pillars of marriage. That's right. There are 10 pillars that make up a healthy marriage. And I've been doing my research, guys. I've been really out here hustling, working with couples, studying and reading and writing and really trying to figure out what makes a healthy marriage healthy. And I found that there are 10 things, 10 pillars. These are things that the foundation of your marriage has to be built upon in order for your marriage to be a long-term, sustaining, healthy, and thriving relationship. Without these things, well, there's a whole host of things that can go awry. And so today, in this session, I'm going to be discussing these 10 pillars. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going in-depth with each of these 10 pillars. Today, see it as more of a, you know, class, like 101 class, where I'm just going over the 10 pillars giving you some insight into what they are, what they look like. And then in future sessions, I'll probably go in depth with each of these individually. So as we are getting started, I'm sure you're probably asking yourself, why should I know these 10 pillars? And how can this information help my marriage? Well, (laughs) I'm glad you asked. First, think of it like this. If you are getting married, let's say you're engaged or you're dating or you're at a place where you're like, you know what, we're courting and I'm, I think marriage is the next step. Well, it would be in your best interest to make sure that you set your marriage up for success. And you do that by ensuring that the exact pillars that are needed to support the weight of your marriage is in place. So this information is going to be useful for you if you aren't even married, but you're leaning in that direction because you'll have the right tools to solidify a healthy foundation. Now, let's say that you have recently gotten married or you've probably been married for three, five years or maybe even two years, right? You're newlywed. Um, As your marriage is maturing, adding these key ingredients into the mix will help ensure that the marriage grows in the right direction and with the right ingredients. You want to make sure that as you are growing, you're using the proper healthy things that a healthy, long-term sustaining marriage requires. And these 10 pillars will be exactly what you need. And then lastly, let's say you've been married for five years or longer and you know you've you've, you've got some skin in the game. You've been in the game for a little while. Well, this information is especially for you. Um, Far too often, I've come across couples who have been married for years, but whose foundation is so faulty that it compromises the structural integrity of the marriage. So this information will help you go back to the basics. It'll help you reevaluate what is missing so that you can begin to properly tend to the pillars that need your attention the most. Okay? So... 
this episode is going to be an overview of the 10 pillars. Um, I'm not going to be able to spend a lot of time going through all 10 because it's a lot of information. And so what I want you guys to do is take this information and then I want you to apply it, research it, study it, and wait to see what else comes in further episodes because I will be spending more time discussing things, these things a lot more. All right, so let's go ahead and dive right in and talk about the 10 pillars. We're going to start with pillar number one. And I guess these are in some order of importance, but may or may not be depending on what's more important to you. So just go with number one and then go from one to 10 in the order that I gave you. And then you can rank order them in terms of importance for your particular marriage. But for my information, I'm going to start with number one, which is spiritual synergy. Now, spiritual synergy is about the combined efforts of you and your spouse interacting spiritually that produces an effect that is greater than what either of you could produce on your own. Spiritual synergy is all about spiritual intimacy. Now, you'll learn later that spiritual intimacy is part of the six areas of intimacy. And so a lot of these things are extremely interconnected. But for now, just understand that spiritual synergy is one of the 10 pillars. And if that is missing, then understand that the foundation of your marriage can be faulty and fracture really quickly. Okay, let's go to pillar number two. Number two is unconditional love. Now, this may come as something that's really obvious. You probably have heard me talk about this many times. I write about this. As a matter of fact, chapter one of my book, The 37 Laws to Mastering Marriage, goes all in on this. And I'm most likely going to do an entire episode uh, directly related to this topic. But for now, just understand that pillar number two is unconditional love. And I like to simplify what unconditional love actually looks like. So I, in my book, talk about how unconditional love means to give all that I have all the time. So when I say I love my spouse unconditionally, or when I say I'm using agape love to love my wife, what I'm really saying is I've made a concerted effort to give all that I have all the time, every single day. It's a choice. It's not based off of how I feel. It's not based off of what I want. It's based off of what I've decided to give to her. I often like to say this, and sometimes my couples struggle when I talk about this at first until I really break it down. But I tell them that unconditional love inside of your marriage is not 50-50. We're not going half on this. As a matter of fact, it's not even 100-100. To be honest, unconditional love inside of your marriage should be 100-0. It's a one-sided contract. Yes, you heard me correctly. It's 100-0, which means I'm giving all that I have without looking to receive anything in return. And I've often noticed that when an individual inside of the marriage starts to get into a selfish or even self-preserving position, it disrupts the ability to give. And now it becomes more about what I can receive. Now it becomes more about what I'm not getting from you and how I'm unhappy because I didn't get this or I, this expectation I have isn't met. And hear me clearly, I'm not saying not to have expectations. I'm not saying not to have desires, but you have to make sure that if you're loving unconditionally, it's based off of a gift that you give every single day. It's, a, it's an act of the will. It's a deliberate decision that you make. It's a mindset that you have. It's not something that you feel. Okay. So just understand that. And if you want more context, again, I'll do a uh, um, podcast on this later, but you can also refer to chapter one of the 37 laws to mastering marriage. I go much more deeper into this topic of unconditional love. Okay. So let's go ahead and keep it moving. And I'm going to go ahead and transition to pillar number three. Now, again, I'm going over the 10 pillars of marriage, and I'm just going to give you guys a brief overview of these 10 pillars. Okay. So number three, is safety and security. And trust me, guys, this pillar is very important. I often see in counseling sessions, this is one of the main areas that people struggle with the most inside of a marriage, okay? Now, let me talk a little bit about safety and security. Just a little bit, not a lot. 
I have a whole chapter devoted to this as well in the book. This is one of the 37 laws to mastering marriage. But I'll say it this way. Safety and security is vital to the human experience. We often thrive in environments where we feel the safest. Likewise, your marriage is one of the environments where safety and security matters the most. Your spouse will not be vulnerable if they don't feel safe. Intimacy will not grow and thrive if they don't feel safe. You will not have influence in your spouse's life if they don't feel safe. So everything that is vital to your marriage is hinged on your ability to create a safe and secure environment for your spouse. Now, you may be thinking, well, I know how to protect my spouse or I know how to make my spouse, my spouse feel safe. But the question is not, can you do it? The question is, do you know what they need from you in order to feel safe and secure? Do you know how they view safety and security? Do you know their family of origin and what they grew up maybe not receiving, what they lacked from their ideal parent, right? All of this will matter as it pertains to your ability to hit the mark correctly when it comes to creating a safe place. If you don't know this information, guys, you're going to struggle when it comes to creating a safe place. And by the way, you may think you're doing a good job until you realize that you're doing a lousy job because they're not satisfied or they're not being vulnerable with you. Okay. So safety and security, pillar number three, very vital, very important. Okay. Let's move forward to number four. (laughs) Again, this is another one that's super important. There's a whole book called Emotional Intelligence 2.0. And that's right. Number four is emotional intelligence. As a matter of fact, this is one of the 37 laws to mastering marriage. It's that vital. Emotional intelligence is the fourth pillar. And it's something that I notice, especially husbands struggle with the most. If you haven't heard of emotional intelligence, well, it's defined as your ability to recognize and understand emotions in yourself and in others, as well as your ability to use this awareness to manage your behavior and the relationships. Now, again, this may seem like a complex definition, and so I would challenge you to go and get the book Emotional Intelligence 2.0, or if you have my book, the 37 Laws to Mastering Marriage, there's a lot in there about emotional intelligence and how that correlates to being in a healthy position inside of your marriage. But this is this is important, guys. And if you've never really studied it, trust me, just learn it. It's something that you can actually acquire and accumulate. And once you have it, it changes the dynamic of your interactions with your spouse, especially to the husbands out there. Please don't overlook this one very valuable, crucial pillar. All right, let's keep it moving. Going to pillar number five. Pillar number five is intimacy. Now, let me ask you a question. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word intimacy? Well, for many people, they think of physical connection, sex, right? (laughs) And intimacy inside of your marriage is deeper than just sex and or also physical affection. Intimacy is all about connection, exposure, and influence. Actually, there are six areas of intimacy as it relates to your marriage. That's right. You heard that correct. Intimacy is not just about physical connection. There are actually six areas of intimacy. Now, let me go over those six areas and then we'll keep it moving. And again, this is just an overview. So my challenge for you is to go take this information and dive deeper. All right, so here are the six areas of intimacy. Intimacy area number one is emotional intimacy. Yes, emotional intimacy is your ability to emote and connect on an emotional level. Number two is intellectual intimacy. This is the transfer of ideas, dreams, uh, thoughts, Things that you have that's in your mind that isn't about how you feel. It's about how you think. That's intellectual intimacy, the transfer of ideas. Number three is physical and one could say sexual intimacy. But it's not just about 
sex. It's not just about copulating. <laughs> it's also about just the small physical gestures that you and your spouse share throughout the course of a day or a week or whatever you may, you know, however you may see it. But it's sexual in nature, meaning it's all about having a physical connection that's more than just what you would have for the friend. Okay. That's the third area of intimacy. Number four is spiritual intimacy. And I was talking about this earlier when I talked about um, the first, the very first pillar, but spiritual intimacy is the connection that you share on a spiritual level. It's not just about having a shared religious experience, right? Not just about going to church, but it's about your studying, um, how you live your life, your moral compass, all those things add to your spiritual intimacy, right? Number five is relational intimacy. Jim Rome has a saying that you're the average of the two to three people that you're the closest to. And your marriage is also the average of the two to three couples that it's the closest to. So who's in your inner circle? Who do you guys have that's holding you guys accountable? Are you connected with people that are trustworthy, that set good examples, that can be a leader, but also individuals that you can also help? right? That's relational intimacy, connecting with people that can be part of your inner circle that can help you guys grow. It's hard to find couples that you trust. So I understand how this may be an area where most couples struggle at, but it's still important nonetheless to have somebody that you're connected to outside of just your spouse in, in terms of another couple or another individual that can hold both of you guys accountable. Sometimes it's a pastor. Sometimes it's a coach. Sometimes it's someone like myself who's a therapist, right? So relational intimacy is important to have. And then number six, the sixth area of intimacy is financial intimacy. This is yet another one of those underutilized, under-focused areas that is so crucial that if this one area of intimacy is rocky, it can cause tremendous ripple effects in a negative manner throughout the lifeline of your marriage. So again, these are the six areas of intimacy. That was the fifth pillar. Intimacy was the fifth pillar. Now we're moving to number six. This is pillar number six of marriage. And that pillar is trust. Yes, trust. See, trust is a key element in human interactions, regardless of what stage of life you're in. As a matter of fact, you actually trust better as an adult if you trust it well as an infant. See, most of how you trust now is directly connected to how you trust it when you came out the womb. Did you have family members that were reliable, that were safe, that fed you when you needed to be fed, that touched you when you needed to be touched, that changed your diaper? Did you have family members that were more in tune with how you felt, with how you emoted? Or did you have somebody that just let you cry it out, that just put you in a crib and, you know, picked you up when it was convenient for them, right? You'll learn really quickly as an infant and even as a toddler who to trust and who not to trust, and how to trust, and whether or not trust is safe. And if that's something that you learned at a young age, that it's not safe to trust the people that you are closest to, or that should be the closest to you, then guess what? As a spouse, you're going to struggle when it comes to trusting them, right? So that's something to keep in mind. And by the way, trust should be viewed as a two-way street, where there is a receiver of trust, and then there is a giver of trust. So it's not just trust is just not one constant. It's something that you have. It's something that you give, but it's also something that you receive. Now, if you are lousy at receiving trust, then that means you are not trustworthy. And if you are lousy at trusting someone, then that means that you struggle to be trusting, right? So there's the truster who's trusting, and then there's, there's the receiver who's worthy of your trust or trustworthy. Now, as a spouse, you want to do your best to be worthy of your partner's trust, worthy of your husband or your wife's trust. And if you aren't, you want to make sure you understand what they require in order to feel like they can give you trust, right? So if you're constantly not being predictable, or not being dependable, or not being consistent, husbands, right? <laughs> I got to point to the men with this one. If you're constantly just trying to move at the sound of your own beat, 
Don't expect for your wife to be good at trusting you because you're proving to your spouse that you are not trustworthy or worthy of her trust. So don't get mad if she's not giving it to you in the manner that you want if you haven't done a good job of protecting her ability to be trusting. Again, I could spend a whole episode just devoted to this. And by the way, I think I will. (laughs) So just be on the standby for that. But for now, just understand that pillar number six is trust. All right, let's move to pillar number seven. Uh, We got a few more to go and then we'll wrap up this session. Number seven is effective communication skills. Again, this is an important one. Uh, And it's important because, listen, we are born with the desire to communicate and we thrive with those who we can communicate with the best. And so if you're struggling in your marriage to connect and communicate with your spouse, then the marriage is going to struggle. It won't thrive. The best marriages house the best communicators. And unfortunately, the worst marriages house individuals who struggle with interpersonal communication skills. This is something that's fundamental to not just the human experience, but to having a healthy marriage. And you will have to take the time to understand your spouse's communication style and learn how to speak in a manner that makes them feel safe and secure. And if you can't do that, guess what? You're going to struggle feeling connected to them. And guess what? they're going to struggle feeling connected to you too. There's going to be a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of small conflicts, a lot of assumptions, and that is cancerous to your marriage. So learn how to communicate effectively. And no matter how well you think you know, trust me, there's still room to grow. Okay? So this is an important pillar I, I, listen, I could spend an entire session with y'all just going over some of the most effective communication skills and techniques and tools that you just need to have. And by the way, you may have a certain approach to communicating that's completely different than your spouse. If you're trying to get understanding from your spouse, you have to communicate on their level, right? You can't give them your communication style expecting them to understand you if you're not speaking the same language or dialect. So make sure that you are malleable and adaptive with your communication style and that you're not just so uh, stuck in your own place or dogmatic about your approach that you completely miss fire every time you're trying to communicate with your spouse. Again, very important. I can be on that all day, but I got to keep going. All right, y'all. Here is number eight, the eighth pillar to healthy marriages is effective conflict resolution skills. Now, I define conflict as the tension that is created by two opposing views. Now, conflict is a natural part of the human experience. And guess what? It goes hand in hand with being married, meaning whatever fantasy you have or whatever uh, fanatical view of you guys just always finishing each other's sentences and never disagreeing, throw that out the window and understand that conflict goes hand in hand with being married. Now, with that being said, I've often noticed that for some reason in marriage, conflict seems to be unwelcomed. And I've learned that it's because of how people view conflict. See, conflict is neither a negative or positive thing. It's actually neutral. Yes, seriously, conflict is a neutral thing. The goal is to see conflict as something that if used correctly can bring tremendous growth to your marriage. The problem though is that most people, they get defensive the moment they feel conflict because they have a negative view and a negative association with conflict. They think that conflict is all about fighting and fussing and arguing. And really, it's just a difference of views, a difference of opinion. It doesn't have to be negative. It doesn't have to be something that is long and drawn out. It just means that there are two different people from two different walks of life seeing two different or seeing one similar situation from two different angles. 
The goal with conflict is to find common ground. There's a Jewish proverb that says, how can two walk together unless they agree? Conflict is all about finding alignment with your spouse and creating synergy. And I found that the couples that are the healthiest have the most healthiest conflict resolution skills. So this is something that you don't want to overlook. You definitely want to make sure that you're investing a lot of time into maximizing your ability to manage conflicts effectively. Okay. And I know I said, like I do with each of these, that I can spend an entire session. I can go maybe two or three sessions with just focusing on conflict resolution skills and giving you guys very efficient, very effective, very tangible conflict resolution tools to help you manage these things that's going to come up, right? Small fires are going to happen inside the marriage. The goal is to make sure that you don't look at a small fire and create something bigger than what it really is, okay? Anyways, let me move on to pillar number nine. That is respect. Yes, respect. Trust me, it may seem obvious but I see a lot of disrespect happening (laughs) inside of marriages. And a lot of times it's because, you know, we often don't know what the other person requires in order to feel respected. We know what we feel and what we require. And so we often superimpose that onto them and we get it wrong. How can you truly submit to one another if there is no respect? How can you truly trust your spouse if there is no respect? How can you truly love unconditionally If you don't have respect for your spouse, right? These are rhetorical questions, but it's something that you must answer and understand. You can't respect them. If you can't respect them, you can't trust them. If you can't respect them, you really can't love them unconditionally. And if you can't respect them, how is their accountability and submission, right? It goes two ways. So I know there's a book written called Love and Respect and that emphasis on and and it puts an emphasis on how wives need love and husbands need respect. Well, wives need respect as well. There are boundaries, there's expectations, there are desires, there are fears. All of those things need to be couched under respect. Right? So husbands respect your wives, wives respect your husbands. Wives respect your husbands, husbands respect your wives. I know the scripture, I know the the book, I know it talks about how you need to love your wives and wives need to respect husbands. But I want to go a step further and say both of y'all should should be respecting each other to the same degree. I know egos for the men, we have a very um, fragile relationship with our egos. And so we require maybe more respect, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be dishing it out just as much as you're receiving it. Okay. Something to think about. And this pillar of marriage has to be in place at all times because without it, the decision to love unconditionally becomes much harder. So Respect affects your desire to even use conflict resolution skills. And ultimately, a lack of respect starts to erode the intimacy that you guys share. So it's a non-negotiable. Respect is a non-negotiable. You give it. Just as much as you desire to receive it, you give it. And you give it first. You give it without receiving it. You give it because that's part of what it means to love unconditionally. Okay? All right, guys, so we've made it all the way to number 10. And this is the 10th pillar of healthy marriages. And that pillar is integrity. Yeah, y'all thought I was going to say something different. (laughs) See, I often define integrity as the consistency between who you are in public and who you are when nobody is looking. What habits do you have in private that you're wearing a mask to cover in public? If that's the case, then there's a small lapse in integrity. I don't want to judge you, but I want to be honest with you now. Integrity means there's consistency and continuity between who you present yourself as and who you really are. Okay. And guess what? Your spouse will definitely know your character and the integrity of your character. They will know. Like they get to see you when you ain't got your eyelashes on, 
They get to see you when your hairline is receding and you're wearing a hat to hide it in public. <laughs> they get to see your dirty laundry and your bad habits and you with your facial hair or you with, when you're bloated, right? They get to see all of the other things that as humans and adults, we like to hide when we're out in public. Well, they know you at your core. And guess what? They're going to be looking at your character and seeing if there's a consistency between who you present yourself as and who you are inside of the marriage behind closed doors. Integrity is a character trait that is often learned and is a key component of developing trust and respect and unconditional love. So if you struggle with integrity, you're going to struggle to trust. If you struggle with integrity, you're going to struggle to respect or be respected. And if you struggle with integrity, unconditional love is going to be stifled. Okay. And I would love to go even further with this as well. However, this episode, this session was just about giving you some indicators of what those 10 pillars look like. And then I want you guys to do something. I want to give you guys an action item. So let's wrap up with this. Let's wrap up with an action item. And here's what I want you to do. You could do this with or without your spouse, preferably with, but if they're not down for it, do it without them. And here's what I want you to do. Using a scale of one to 10 with one being the lowest and 10 being the highest, I want you to answer this question. How well are you performing at each of these pillars? How well are you performing in each of these pillars? Are you doing well? Are you not doing so great? And to go a step further, I want you to start with your lowest rated pillar, and I want you to begin intentionally working to increase your performance in that area. And listen, be honest, be fair, be true, right? Don't just try to rate yourself great. And as a matter of fact, you may want to ask your spouse to rate you in these 10 pillars. That'll get you a much more honest uh, assessment of where you are, and maybe you can rate them in regards to those 10 pillars. And then I want you to pick the lowest rated pillar and start working on increasing it. So maybe you have a two in the area of conflict resolution, or maybe you have a four in the area of intimacy. Well, I want you to pick that area if that's your lowest and start studying, researching, strategizing on how to improve and enhance that particular pillar. Trust me, your marriage is only as strong as the weakest link. And so if you're the weakest in one of these areas, then that's going to be as strong as your marriage is, right? And so you want to make sure you're focusing on improving on all of these areas. But let's start with the lowest rated area. And, and, and by the way, if you have questions about this or about any of these areas, please, please feel free to submit a question on the website. That way I can better answer your questions live on air when I do my Q&A segment, okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to wrap up here. And I just want to appreciate you for coming to the Marriage Counselor's Corner and joining me in a session where we're talking about some things that will definitely enhance your marriage. And I just want to say thank you. Welcome Appreciate your company. I enjoyed having you here. And hey, I want you to join me in the next episode where we will talk about another very, very, very important topic that you don't want to miss out on. And like I was saying earlier, please don't forget to go to the website marriagecounselorscorner.com. That's marriagecounselorscorner.com. And leave your questions. Leave something that I can answer live on air. Also, don't forget to leave me an honest rating and review wherever you subscribe to the podcast, and I will make sure to continue delivering high quality, very tangible, very useful, impactful content for your marriage. All right, guys, I appreciate your time coming to the office for this session. I will see you in the next episode. All right now, deuces. Thanks for stopping by for your seat on the couch at the Marriage Counselor's Corner. Remember, go to marriagecounselorscorner.com to schedule your next session. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss a session. We look forward to having you back on the couch soon. Bye-bye now.